Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. I'm Dino. Well, we're already into October here in Niagara Falls, and what that means to me is it's time to get my snowmobile ready for the upcoming season. It won't be long before the temperatures drop, the snow starts to fly, and I start to get the itch to flip the paddle. The first thing I need to do though is get this thing cleaned up. I'll be honest. I haven't been too kind to my skidoo over the summer. It's been sitting in the corner here collecting dust as I renovate the shed and work on the DR650 all summer long. Because of that, it's got a fairly dense coat of dust on it. I'm gonna blow that off and I'm gonna take it outside and give it a good wash before we do anything else. So why don't you sit back, grab yourself something warm to drink, and enjoy Dino's Tinker Shed. I love the summer, but I really love the winter. I'll see you in a minute. Now that the sled's back on the ground, I'm going to start it and warm it up before I drive it out of here to get it washed. I haven't started this in probably three or four months, so it might be a little bit stumbly, but I'm going to try it. Let's give it a shot now. Like I thought, a little bit stumbly. Sometimes there gets to be a little bit of moisture in the, in the fuel. And it takes a bit of running before it smooths out for the season. But I think that's pretty good. Now I always like to let the sled warm up for a bit until it gets to be about 50 or 60 degrees Celsius on the temperature gauge before I try to move it or really give it any kind of throttle. It doesn't take long because liquid-cooled snowmobiles like this don't have any kind of fan and they don't really have a radiator, they have a heat exchanger. So temperature ramps up pretty fast in this big triple and soon we'll be able to get it outside. That's good, we can get the washing. I know I've washed quite a few different things on this channel and I always say the same thing, but it, I believe it is worth reiterating here. When you're washing power sports, you want to be careful when you're using your water. And you'll see here that I am not actually using a pressure washer on my sled here, I'm just using hose pressure. I'll use a soft brush to do the general wash over with just some regular automotive soap. But I want to be sure, especially when I come to the suspension, that I'm not forcing water into any of the bearings under there. Once I'm done washing, I'm going to follow that up with some compressed air to get the majority of the uh, water off. And I'll follow that up with a soft cloth here just to sort of get the remainder of any loose water before I bring it back into the shed. It's a good practice and it should keep your power sport 
in good condition for years to come. All right, now that I have the snowmobile cleaned and dried, I'm gonna bring it inside and for me, I'm gonna put it up on my snowmobile lift just to get it a little bit higher. Before I do anything else, I'm gonna take the time to wax all of the smooth body panels and Lexan plastics that are on this snowmobile. And I'm gonna do it for a couple reasons. Now I'm just gonna use a regular old paste wax, an automotive paste wax. And I'm gonna rub it in a circular motion and let that haze up on the body panel. I'll just follow that with a clean cloth once it's all dry. And you get a nice luxuriously glimmering body panel. Now the reason I do this is for two or three different reasons, I guess. The first one basically is just protecting my investment. A snowmobile like this today is probably around 15 to $16,000 Canadian if you were to buy it new. And the way that the power sports industry is, even used sleds like this run 13 to $14,000. That's a big chunk of change. By keeping all the smooth body panels waxed, it keeps them looking good and keeps your resale value for your machine when you want to upgrade or someday get rid of it. Maybe you're going to get out of the sport. The other thing that I like about waxing all the body panels is that when you're riding, there are times when you end up punching through snow drifts, you end up with snow that gets packed onto the hood and the body panels of the sled. And I've even had it where it's choked up all the air intakes on the hood to the point where the snowmobile didn't really run as good as it was supposed to. By waxing the body panels and all of the plastics, the snow tends to slide off of it much easier and you don't get as much buildup on the body panels themselves. It's a great thing. The other thing I like about waxing, especially if you are open towing these on a trailer, a flat deck, or even in the back of your truck, is you're gonna get salt spray on these machines if you're towing them with an open trailer. Even with a cover, you will get salt built up on the sled. By waxing it, it makes cleaning that salt much easier than if you didn't wax it, and again, helps protect your investment. Along with waxing, there's another component on most modern sleds that helps stop snow penetration in and underneath the cowlings. And that's this material here. Now I know this stuff as frog skin and you can buy it as an aftermarket component for older snow machines to sort of block off openings into the hood area. But on many modern snowmobiles, this 2018 included, well, all of the air intake areas are covered in this frog skin. Now this acts both as a filter, but it also stops any water or snow from getting down into where your intake is for your throttle bodies. Now you wanna make sure there's no rips or tears in this stuff and that it's not covered in any kind of sand or, or any kind of lint that might've picked up over the summer months. So just take a look at that stuff and make sure it's in good shape. With the waxing complete, we're ready to start looking at the snowmobile and making a list of things that we're gonna to need to do before the season starts. That's what this video is primarily gonna be about. We're not gonna get into any kind of service today. It's more of a visual inspection to make a list of things you need to do before the season starts. Now, we're starting here around the 1st of October because this gives us time to order parts if we need them, identify problems if we have to, and ultimately get them fixed and get the machine ready for the season long before you ever need it. There's nothing worse than having all the trails starting to open up for you and you still have things to do on your sled. So let's start here at the front. We've already taken a look at all the panels because we waxed them all. Now, if you do have cracking in your panels, you can either choose to leave it, replace it, 
Or if you want to sort of stop the cracking, there are a couple options that you could do, whether it's plastic welding or zip tie stitching, just to keep those panels from further continuing to crack. Once we get through there, we're gonna look at things like bumpers, making sure that the bumpers are still in good shape and that if you needed to use it to lift the front end up or the rear end, that they're solid enough to do so. Your bumpers often are the only thing you have to sort of get yourself unstuck. You want those to be in good shape. Next, I'm gonna turn my attention to the suspension. Now, whether it's a modern double A arm type suspension, uh, a leading arm or trailing arm, depending on how you look at it, of the older sleds, or even leaf spring suspension, like a really old sled, they all do have some similarities. All of them have bushings of some type in them, which you should be inspecting to make sure they're not worn out. And they all have some form of compression and rebound damping in form of a shock. Now my shock here is a non-rebuildable shock. So when it finally starts to give me some problems, I have to replace it either with an original part or at that point, maybe an upgraded rebuildable shock that I can service. Either way, what you're gonna be looking for is to make sure that the shock tube itself isn't bent or damaged. If it's dented, that means the internal components can't slide effectively. You also wanna make sure that there's no oil that's leaking down onto the chrome shafts down here, which would indicate a seal leak. A seal leak eventually will drain all the oil and all of the damping ability out of those shocks. And you'll end up with a suspension that doesn't perform properly, especially in big bumps. You're going to find it's going to bottom out faster. It's going to rebound much quicker, making the steering somewhat unpredictable. On the modern suspensions, quite often they use a double A-arm type setup like this of some type. And they tend to have a lot of bushings that are holding the control arms in place and eventually do wear out. This excess chassis is known to have these bushings wear out relatively fast. And most people upgrade these with a bronze oil light bushing, which gives you years of nice tight service in there and keeps the suspension aligned properly. So your steering's really accurate. As you move down, you're gonna wanna make sure that none of the control arms are bent or damaged, which could again um, impact the way the sled steers. At the ends here, on, at least on these modern sleds, you have these um, basically uh, ball joints like on your car, and they eventually do wear out and get a little bit sloppy and do need to be replaced. And you're gonna find these heim joints on the tie rods, which connect your steering and your skis together so that everything turns properly and you get the proper toe in on the snow machine to make sure it doesn't dart any more than it would normally. As we move down to the skis, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that they're not cracked or in any kind of condition that they might fail on you at high speeds. You wanna make sure that the, the ski loops themselves are straight, they're not damaged and that they're fastened properly. And for me on this particular ski, I know that my carbides underneath here do need to be replaced. Now these provide a couple of, um, a couple of jobs for the sled itself. Number one, and probably the most important, is fresh carbides basically provide grip when you're turning on icy or hard surfaces. Without them, the way mine are all worn flat, I can't really turn that good on icy trails and uh, trying to get into a gas station across uh, concrete or asphalt was getting really, really challenging last winter. So I know that I have to change the skags out on these TS skis this year and I'll show you how to do that in another video. Other than that, the front end is pretty much done. Now you are going to want to look at one other place, especially if the sled is new to you before you buy it. And that's down in around the bulkhead, just to make sure nothing's bent under there or looks out of place. I don't expect everybody to be a master mechanic, but you should be observant. And that's what really separates a, uh, an amateur mechanic from somebody that just doesn't know anything and just wants to ride. You can take a look underneath, and if you see parts that don't quite line up right, or maybe the bolt holes are missing on a bolt here or there, 
you should be suspect before you actually buy the machine. And this is really what you're looking for um, if it's your own snowmobile. It's just to kind of get under there and see if something actually happened the last time you were riding it. Making sure all the fasteners are in place and that they are at least finger tight so that you can't undo them with your fingers. As we move back from the front of the snow machine, we're going to get into the cockpit area here. There's quite a few things that you just want to just take a quick look at and make sure that everything works. The first thing is, I always like to check my grips, and I know this sounds goofy, but I want to make sure that I haven't worn through the bottom or the top of the grips over the years of riding. Now, I had a Polaris snow machine that I actually wore all the way through into the heating elements of the grips and had to change them. And I'm glad I did that before the season started. When it's warm like this, you can set the grips, you can glue them on, and they adhere really well. You're not rushing the job. So you want to make sure that first the grips are in good condition, and then you want to start the machine up and make sure the grips and the heated thumb both work. Now, on a machine like this, an Ace 900, neither the grips or the thumb will turn on until at least 2,000 RPM. So you may need to put the back end up on a stand to get up to that RPMs before you get any heat through those grips. But it is worth doing because there's nothing worse than riding a modern sled without heated grips or a thumb. Now, when we're talking about the flipper here, you want to make sure that it moves freely. Most modern sleds are fuel injected but very few of them are like my ACE here that are actually fly-by-wire. There's no cable connecting to any mechanical device. Most of them still have a cable that runs down either to a throttle body or a lot of older sleds are still carbureted. You want to make sure that that's moving freely and you may want to lubricate the cable to make sure it doesn't freeze up on you in the winter time. Um, these do have uh, a bit of a tendency to rust if you don't maintain them, and that can lead to a stuck throttle, which is not a fun condition to have. Similarly, you're gonna to wanna to take a look, make sure your brake fluid is in good condition, that it's nice and honey yellow, that it's not all black and gross. If it is, you're gonna to wanna to change that brake fluid out. This is also a good time just to grab your handlebars, give them a good shake and a good rattle to make sure that all of the fasteners are nice and tight and that the steering itself moves freely. Next, I go through and check all of the lighting, the high, the low beam, my dash lights, anything that has a, a light bulb in it, your tail light, to make sure that those are all operating correctly and I can change them if I find that, say, one of the front headlight bulbs is burnt out. I usually check my GPS power too to make sure that's working. Now this particular unit has a lot of other little switches and doodads. It's got a computerized display. This one has air suspension in it. It's got three different engine modes on it. You can certainly go through and make sure all of those features are functioning correctly while it's inside on a stand or even just a, a track lift on the back to make sure that everything's functioning. It's a really good thing to do. Now, not all snowmobiles come with mirrors, but if yours does, take the time to make sure that they're nice and clean and that they still move freely. Sometimes these things will seize up and it's best to get them sort of unseized in the beginning and not wait till you're out on the trail to try and get a good view. These are a great safety feature and if you do have the option to put them on there, it's a great thing to have. They may not look as cool as some of the sports sleds, but I'll tell you, when you're trail riding, these things are invaluable. Anyway, I'm gonna get these ones clean. Now that we've looked at the cockpit, it's really time to look at the engine bay on both sides of the machine. Now, depending on the make, model, and year of your snow machine, access to the engine bay is quite different model to model and make to make. This 2018 XS chassis from Skidoo gains access through two batwing panels on either side of the engine. And I'll open these up right now. These swing out of the way and even lift off if you want them to, to give you good access to the engine from either side. 
Inside this particular panel, I'm going to start by looking at my battery. Now, snowmobiles and power sports in general are pretty abusive to their batteries and their charging systems. There's a lot of vibration that these deal with, and in the case of a snowmobile, they're usually operating in minus degree temperatures in, in terms of uh, minus 10, minus 20. I've even ridden in minus 35 Celsius. And these batteries take a real kicking, especially when you try to start your machine first thing in the morning as a cold start. What I'm gonna do first is I'm visually gonna look at the battery and make sure there's no damage, visible damage. There's no cracks, it's not leaking any acid. There's no bulges in it that weren't there originally when I bought the battery. Next, I'm gonna check all of the connections, make sure they're tight, they're clean and free of corrosion, and then I'm gonna take a look at all of the wires and make sure that they are nice and tight. Loose connections lead to bad charging and ultimately bad starting, and it can really be a ghost of a thing to try and find if everything's not tight. This one here is actually a little bit loose. I'm gonna have to tighten that on this, on this solenoid. Now, I also like to check the static battery voltage before I start the machine and see what it sits at. It should sit somewhere around 12.5 volts, um, which should give you enough to start the machine. It's not a true load test, but at least it'll give you an idea that the battery's fully charged. Next, I'll start the machine and I'll take a look at what the voltage output is to the battery. This will tell me the condition of the stator and the voltage regulator and making sure that it's A, producing over 12 and a half volts. It should be somewhere around 14, maybe 14 and a half volts, but it also shouldn't be overcharging. So if you see 18 or 20 volts, you have a problem too. Your voltage regulator is probably damaged. Now from here, I'm gonna take a look at the reverse mechanism. Not all snowmobiles have reverse, and some of them, especially like two strokes, they actually rotate the engine backwards now. So there's not an actual gear mechanism inside the chain case. Now for my 900 Ace, it uses a, a basically a solenoid of types, or a, a servo, I guess is better, to actuate the reverse gear mechanism. Now, I prefer a manual lever over this system, which is electronic, it's complex, there's more things to break down, but this is how it arrived. So when I start to check battery voltage, I'll run the reverse mechanism a couple times to make sure it's shifting properly, there's no unusual noises, and I'll run the throttle a little bit to make sure that it, it actually moves the track properly. You'll wanna check to make sure your chain case is not leaking to start with, and you can also open it up and check to make sure there's the right amount of fluid in it. The other thing that's underneath this side of the cover on my snowmobile is my coolant reservoir. Now, Skidoo uses an orange colored coolant. It's a long life coolant that's supposed to be changed, I think every five years. So next year I'm due to change that coolant but I'm gonna to wanna to make sure that it's topped up when it's cold to the proper line with the proper coolant. And I'm gonna take a look inside the engine and make sure there's no leaks anywhere that I can see that may indicate that I've either got a head gasket or maybe a, a hose that's leaking. And when we get underneath the snowmobile, we're gonna look at the heat exchangers as well to make sure they're not leaking. The other area you may want to take a look at when you're first starting is make sure all your springs on your exhaust system are intact and there's no signs of leakage around the exhaust donuts. This is usually quite a telltale sign as you'll get black carbon buildup around the unions that are being held together by the springs. So if you get that uh, or if you see that, you may have to take your exhaust off, change the donuts, and maybe put a fresh set of springs on to make sure they have the right amount of pressure clamping those two pieces together. All right, let's have a look at the other side. As we come around to the PTO side or the clutch side, it opens up exactly the same way, at least on this skidoo here. Now remember, some older sleds actually the bonnet tips up just like an old race car. 
And this exposes our clutch. In this case, engine oil, I'm gonna to wanna to check that. I change my oil every season. It's a good idea on a four stroke to do that. But on a two stroke, if that's what you own, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that your fluid levels are topped up. You're gonna to wanna to check down below to make sure that none of the oil lines are leaking or anything like that. You definitely don't wanna be losing two stroke oil out on the trail. To get to my particular clutch, there's another cover here and it pulls out relatively easily. Now, one thing to take note of is your spare belt to make sure that it's in good shape and that you even have one. That's one of the things that torqued me about Skidoo is when I bought this brand new, I had to actually buy a spare belt to put in the spare belt holder that they include on this cover. It was crazy. It should come with one for free. With this cover completely removed, we can now see the condition of our clutches. Now, I'm gonna be honest, I should have taken better care of these clutches over the last summer, but I didn't. And what you'll find is they've got a fairly good coat of oxidization on them, whereas normally I would go through with a rag, put a bit of WD-40 on it, and wipe all of these down. Now, when you look at your clutches, you're looking for a few things. You're gonna obviously check to make sure nothing's loose in them, but you're also gonna to wanna to be able to polish all of that um, oxidization off. You're gonna check your belt to make sure it's in decent shape. And if you can, you're gonna to wanna to measure the width of your belt to make sure that it's still within spec. And you should be able to find that information in your operator's manual, how wide the belt needs to be. But in general, you just don't wanna see it all checked all ripped apart on the sides, anything like that. I've got a video on servicing the clutch on this particular machine, and I'll include it in the description if you really want to know how to service it and how to set up your belt deflection and whatnot. I'll, I'll include that in the link below. But generally, again, you're looking in here for any exhaust leaks, any fluid leaks, anything like that that you may need to add to your list to service. At the very least, you're gonna to want to cycle your clutches and make sure that they fully operate and they haven't seized up over the summer. My exciter that I told you about in the beginning had a seized secondary clutch and it wouldn't shift gears at all. I disassembled it, cleaned and polished all the internals, put it back together and it worked really, really well. No matter where it's located, your brakes are extremely important to check before the season starts. Now on skidoos, it's located down here on the drive shaft. And I'll tell you, I absolutely hate this cover getting it on and off. I wish Skidoo would do something about that. Maybe they have on the newer models, I'm not sure. Either way, when you get access to it, you're gonna wanna make sure that the rotor itself is in decent shape. Mine's got a little bit of rust on it, obviously, from sitting all season. And I wanna make sure that there's lots of brake pad left on the actual caliper, the pads themselves, and this one's good. As I'm in here, I'm gonna take a look at the caliper, make sure that there's no brake dust or uh, uh, brake fluid leaking out of the caliper anywhere in the area. This one doesn't have it. And if you can see it, check the brake hoses themselves to make sure they're not chafed or rubbing on anywhere. This one looks good. I'm gonna give it a little bit of spray with some brake clean just to get the rust off of it. And then I'll put it back together. As I continue to move back on the actual snow machine, I'm going to take a look at these mounting bolts that hold the rear suspension into the tunnel. Now, every suspension is a little bit different, but most traditional snowmobile rear suspension is held in place with only four small bolts. Now, these bolts can have a tendency to vibrate free, and I had this problem with a Polaris snowmobile that I had a few years ago. And it took a lot of Loctite to actually hold the bolts in place. And even then, sometimes these would vibrate free. These tracks produce a fair amount of vibration, and these bolts can sometimes be a weak point. Now, from the factory, Skidoo it, it puts a very good Loctite on these. But it's a good idea just to take a ratchet and try to tighten them up, see if they tighten at all. You don't want to get to the point where you break that Loctite. You just want to make sure they're not loose and you're going to be able to feel that quite easily just using a small ratchet. But I always do check these at the beginning of the season and before each ride. 
As we get further down into the suspension, the rear suspension, we're going to look at very similar things to we looked at at the front suspension. So things like bushings, the shock itself to make sure it's not leaking, it's in good shape. Now in the case of this R-Motion skid, it uses torsion springs. There's a few things you're going to want to look at when you're checking out your springs before the season starts. You want to make sure that firstly, they're not damaged. So they should be nice and straight in this area. They shouldn't be bowed and they shouldn't be extremely rusty either. These ones do have a little bit of rust on the bottom that I'm going to clean up probably with a little bit of steel wool. But you really don't want too much rust on these things because they'll chew through these little slide guides here and eventually they'll wear the system out. Now, similar to a coil spring, you're going to want to check out to make sure there's no cracks or any fractures up top where they're attached. And in the case of these torsion springs, you're going to want to make sure that your adjusters for preload are the same on both sides. Now for coil springs, again, general overall condition, they can be a little bit more rusty because they don't have these guides, but you want to for sure make sure there's no cracked or snapped off coils within the actual spring itself and that it's seated properly in the cups on the top and the bottom of the actual shock assembly. Other than that, they're pretty easy to, to uh, inspect and make sure they're in good condition. You're going to definitely want to look at all your slide rails, make sure there's no cracking or any missing bolts. And you're going to want to make sure that your actual sliders, your high facts down here, still have some wear left on them before you start the season. I put these DuPont slides on about two years ago. There's hardly any wear on them. They really are a good product. Whereas my old Polaris that I had before this, I would put high facts on pretty much every year, um, at least you know once every season and a half because it wear out so fast. You're gonna also wanna go along and check all of your idler wheels along here. You're gonna wanna make sure that the tire that's on them, the rubber, isn't cracked or missing sections. You're gonna wanna make sure that when you spin them, they spin smooth and the bearings aren't all full of grit or that they're not completely seized up. These are fairly easy to service and I'm gonna do a video just on how to change the bearings on these in a future episode. Now, the other thing you're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that the, the actual suspension itself, that the skid frame is lubricated. Different models have different amounts of grease fittings this uh, R-Motion only has one or two fittings in total, whereas I had um, a Polaris with an M10 in it, and it had probably seven or eight grease fittings, and I actually liked that. I like being able to put grease into, uh, into your suspension. If you have them, you can always take a look at your ice scratchers and make sure that they are in good shape and that they're functioning properly. These ones are, these have carbide on them too, which is great. And you're gonna to wanna to take a look at your track itself to make sure that the tension is in good condition, that it's set to what the factory tells you to do. It's centered, it's not missing too many lugs or too big a tears. And if you have studs, that they're all in place and that you don't have some that are threatening to actually spit out as you ride or pull through. I'm also gonna take a look up underneath here. This is a liquid cooled machine, so it has a pair of um, uh, heat exchangers up under there that take the coolant from the engine, and as snow dust comes up and over top of them, it cools the engine coolant, and in turn cools the engine temperature. You wanna make sure those are in good condition, there's no holes in them, they're not leaking, and uh, other than that, you just want to make sure your snow flaps also in place because on modern snowmobiles that snow flap really does sort of modulate the way the snow dust flows up underneath the tunnel and if it's missing or it's damaged you may not get the right amount of cooling to these new machines they can be a little bit fussy other than that really you're just going to check any attachment points for for luggage things like that make sure it's in good condition and that your rear bumper's in good shape, and well, you're probably ready to go, or you have a good list of repairs that you need to get done before the season starts. 
All right. That brings us to the end of today's episode on your pre-season inspection on your snow machine. Now again, I'm riding a Skidoo snowmobile here, but these points, well, they're all relative to all makes and models, whether it's an Arctic Cat, a Yamaha, a Polaris, or maybe even something like a Ski Whiz or a Kawasaki. A pre-season inspection will help you save time, make your season more enjoyable, and most importantly, will make it safer. Now, depending on your make or model, there may be other things that you need to inspect and make sure are working right. All these machines are all a little bit different and they all have their own little quirks. So take your time to read through your manual and determine what other inspections you need to do to make sure your sled's ready to ride. Now, until then, I've got to button all of this stuff back up. I now have my list of things that I need to get done before the snow flies and I have time to get those jobs accomplished and I hope you do too. Now if you like today's video, please leave a comment down below. I love reading the comments. It really does help me make better content and if you really, really liked it, well, you can always like and subscribe to the channel. It helps me and it helps YouTube to determine who else may want to watch this type of content. Until then, I hope to see you soon, right back here at Dino's Tinker Shed. I'll see you soon and you have yourself a great day. Bye for now.